This page was created to teach black history. Unfortunately, the American educational system was designed to exclude our real historical account, so we are here to dismantle it. It's time to enlighten those of us who have been kept in the dark. I too was a black man who didn't know enough about our own history, so I began to dig deeper and do my own research. I want people of all races and cultures to join together to learn our history as one. Here, I will share all of my findings. Please share and support Teaching Black History. The Story of Ellen and William Craft. Ellen Craft was born in 1826 in Clinton, Georgia, to Maria, a mixed race slave and her wealthy master, Major James Smith. At least three quarters European by ancestry, Ellen was very fair skinned and resembled her white half siblings who were her master's legitimate children. Smith's wife gave the 11 year old slave Ellen as a wedding gift to her daughter, Eliza Smith, to get the girl out of the household and remove the evidence of her husband's infidelity. Ellen grew up as a house servant to Eliza in the city of Macon. William was born in Macon where he first met his future wife at the age of 16 when his first master sold him to settle gambling debts. Before he was sold, William witnessed his 14-year-old sister and each of his parents being separated by sales to different owners. William's new master apprenticed him as a carpenter and allowed him to work for fees, taking most of his earnings. At the age of 20, Ellen married William Craft, not wanting rear family in slavery. During the Christmas season of 1848, the couple planned an escape. Ellen planned to take advantage of her appearance to pass as white while the pair traveled by train and boat to the north. She dressed as a man, since at the time it was not customary for a white woman to travel alone, let alone with a slave. She also faked illness to limit conversation as she was uneducated. William was to act as her slave and personal servant. During that time period, domestic slaves frequently accompanied their master doing travel, so the craft did not expect to be questioned. To their surprise, they were detained, but only temporarily. Their escape is known as the most ingenious plot in fugitive slave history. During their escape, they traveled on first-class trains, stayed in the best hotels, and Ellen dined one evening with a steamboat captain. Ellen cut her hair and bought appropriate clothes to pass as a young man traveling in a jacket and trousers. William used his earnings as a cabinet maker to buy clothes for Ellen to appear as a white slaveholder. They carefully selected clothes that white male slaveholders would wear. Ellen's wardrobe included a top hat, crivet, jacket tartan, and a tassel, all of which signified slaveholder status. William fixed her hair to add to her manly appearance. Ellen also practiced the correct gestures and behaviors. She wore her right arm in a sling to hide the fact that she did not know how to write. Although the crafts had several close calls along the way and neither could read nor write, they were successful in evading detection. During the next two years, the crafts made numerous public appearances to recount their escape and speak against slavery. Because society generally disapproved at the time of women speaking to public audiences of mixed gender, Ellen typically stood on the stage while William told their story. In 1850, Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act, which increased penalties for aiding fugitive slaves and required residents and law enforcement of free states to cooperate in capturing and returning such slaves to their owners. The act provided 
for a reward to officers and simplify the process by which people might be certified as slaves, requiring little documentation from slave catchers. A month after the new law was effective, Collins sent two bounty hunters to Boston to retrieve the crafts. Upon arriving to Boston, they were met with resistance by both white and black Bostonians. Abolitionists in Boston had formed the biracial Boston Vigilance Committee to resist the new slave bill. Its members protected the crafts by moving them around various safe houses until they could leave the country. The two bounty hunters finally gave up and returned to the South. Collins even appealed to the President of the United States asking him to intervene so he could regain his property. The President agreed that the craft should be returned to their owners in the South and authorized the use of military force if necessary to take them. The crafts and many other fugitive slaves were no longer safe in the North. That year, the couple moved to Liverpool, England. The craft spent 19 years in England. In 1868, the crafts returned with three of their five children to the United States. They raised funds from supporters, and in 1870, they bought 1,800 acres of land in Georgia near Savannah. There, they founded the Woodville Cooperative Farm School in 1873 for the education and employment of freed men. In 1876, William Kraft was charged with the misuse of funds, and he lost a libel case in 1878 in which he tried to clear his name. The school closed soon after. Although the Krafts tried to keep the farm running, dropping cotton prices and post-Reconstruction era violence contributed to its failure. Whites discriminated against freed men while working to reestablish white supremacy in politics and economics. In 1890, the Krafts moved to Charleston, South Carolina to live with their daughter Ellen. The elder Ellen Kraft died in 1891 and William on January 29th, 1900.